Hello and welcome to Broadcasting Scotland. So today we're going to give a special coverage of First Minister's questions. Now these are usually on Thursdays, but today it's been brought forward the two Wednesday because of a public holiday. So First Minister's questions will begin in Holly Holyrood in just a few minutes. And we hear first up will be Colin Beatty, who's the MSP for Midlothian and Musselburgh. Colin Beatty is going to ask the First Minister about fly tipping and Luther in general. Then David Torrance, also M SNP for Kirkcaldy, has a question on whether the government can update regarding support given to the renewable energy supply chain. So these are under general questions. Then Mark Griffin, Scottish Labour, is going to ask about uh, how many people have been helped onto the property ladder by Scottish Government schemes since uh, the year 2017. Um, some other general questions before we move on at um, about 20 past two questions from party leaders. So first up will be Douglas Ross, who's the Conservative Party member for Highlands and Islands. And he, of course, is a Conservative leader for Scotland. Uh, so we don't know what Douglas Ross is going to focus on. Uh, next, Anna Sarwar for the Labour Party. We'll ask his questions. The party leaders will get a couple of supplementary questions. The um, members to start with in general questions will get one question and one answer. However, looking at uh, further questions, Murdo Fraser, uh, MSP for the Conservatives, is going to ask, how does the First Minister plan to address the reported potential spending gap of £3.5 So that's um, a figure that's been made up by certain estimates. That figure of a £3.5 billion funding gap, or some newspapers reported it as £4.5 it, it's not actually a real figure. It wasn't in the estimates which Kate Forbes um, gave to Parliament yesterday, but there has been some discussion of, again, the wording of Murdo Fraser's question is of a potential gap. So we'll see whether the First Minister thinks that gap is a, is a fact or um, a theoretical idea. Um, so I, again, after the uh, party leaders, Sarah Boyack for Labour will, will also be asking a question about um, what's, uh, what's the position on Scotland's census, which is now just completed. Uh, she's asking whether the census has been a credible exercise. Uh, next, we're going to have Gillian Mackay, MSP, is going to ask the First Minister, what is the Scottish Government's response to the finding from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine report on beds in the NHS, saying that uh, since 2010, 4,227 beds have been taken out of active service in the NHS. OK, so we'll see what the First Minister says about that. I dare say she'll talk about community care. Maybe some of these beds are not needed. Uh, but also, I wonder if, if she'll refer to the situation in other countries in the UK uh, where the situation is worse. And, and most measures, of course, I'm sure you're aware, the Scottish NHS does show itself up to be the best operating of the four in the UK. So we'll be going shortly to Holyrood for First Minister's, First Minister's questions. And I am told that the First Minister herself is actually going to be here. Last week, she was deputised, of course, by John Swinney, who's the Deputy First Minister, uh, because, of course, the First Minister was down with the COVID. Uh, so we hear she's back uh, at work today. So, as usual, First Minister's questions begins with the general questions from members of the Parliament. And uh, then the party leaders' questions will come on, on about 2.20. You can always pick up First Minister's questions on Broadcasting Scotland, usually on Thursdays. And, of course, if you haven't seen us before, we also do the, late, the nightly news programme, Scotland at 7. And I will be doing that later on today, of course. Um, so uh, thanks for joining us on the Scottish uh, Broadcasting Scotland coverage of First Minister's question time from Holyrood. We should be going to Holyrood in just a few seconds, and we'll hear from the presiding officer. Good afternoon. Officer. The first item of business is general the, um, questions. In order to get in as many people as possible, I'd be uh, grateful for short, succinct on that? questions mm -hmm. and responses to match. And at question number one, I that. call Colin Beatty. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the new national litter and fly tipping strategy for Scotland. Minister Mary McCallum. The consultation on our proposals for a new national litter and fly tipping strategy closed on 31 March and we are currently analysing the responses. The final strategy will be published later this year, taking into account those consultation responses. Um, proposals in the consultation, including measures to strengthen enforcement, raising fixed penalties, 
improving data collection, supporting private land owners and local authorities. Um, illegal waste activities, which are a blight on communities, have no place in Scotland, and we are working with partners and law enforcement to detect, deter and disrupt waste crimes across Scotland. Colin Beattie. Fly tipping and littering causes great frustration to the whole community. Midlothian Council states fly tipping alone costs them £60,000 a year, which is a huge amount of resource spent on preventable behaviour. What further support can the Scottish Government give to help local authorities, police, the Procurator, Fiscal Service and even private landowners to tackle fly tipping and ensure appropriate action is taken to prosecute those that do so? Minister. Thanks, Presiding Officer, and I thank the member for the supplementary question. Um, I, I fully appreciate the challenges facing private landowners and local authorities and the impact that the pandemic has had on reporting littering and fly tipping rates. Um, although the ultimate responsibility for cleaning up litter and materials that have been fly tip rests with the local authorities and with landowners, we are working across multiple agencies to try and tackle the issue uh, with a firm uh, focus on prevention. Uh, but our National fl Litter and Fly Tipping Strategy Consultation also proposed a range of further measures to enforce litter and fly tipping offences, including raising fixed penalty notices and exploring the use of civil penalties, which we will pursue subject to the outcome of the consultation. Myrtle Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister will know that I have recently uh, completed a consultation on uh, potential legislative changes uh, around uh, fly tipping, and I look forward to meeting her ministerial colleague uh, next week uh, to discuss these. But one issue that has come clearly out of that consultation is public concern about restricted access to uh, council recycling centres potentially being a factor in encouraging uh, or, or uh, people irresponsibly uh, fly tipping instead. I know that Fife Council have just announced they are looking at reducing their charges for bulk uplift of waste in order to try and make that an easier route for people. Will the Scottish Government look at how they can better support councils who want to provide better and cheaper facilities for those who want to do the right thing? Minister. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, just, the Scottish Government shares Murdo Fraser's ambition to tackle fly tipping, and uh, our recent consultation set out proposals on areas that uh, I know Mr. Fraser had identified for further action, including improving data quality and strengthening the enforcement measures that I mentioned previously. However, uh, there are some differences in uh, the proposed approach to the bill, and I know he mentions he will be meeting with my colleague Lorna Slater next week. Um, as regards access to local authority recycling centres, this is something which local authorities uh, understandably had uh, issues to deal with over the process of the pandemic. And access to these facilities are obviously very important, and consideration of all of these issues were borne in mind as we developed the consultation, the responses to which we are now uh, reviewing. Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Minister if they can update the Parliament on the Scottish, what the Scottish Government is doing to assist with recycling hard to recycle items? Minister. Oh, I'm sorry, Presiding Officer. Just... Uh, on Monday, the Scottish Government launched two consultations on a circular economy bill and a waste route map. Together, these consultations set out the, the key proposed actions and the tools that we will put in place to help everyone play their part in cutting waste in our economy and in capitalising on the economic opportunities that a circular economy clearly presents. Um, the route map includes a proposal to embed decisions about recycling in the design and sale of products. And again, my colleague Lorna Slater has also recently announced the first investments from our landmark £70 million recycling improvement fund. And that is over £20 million being awarded to 13 local authorities to increase the quantity and quality of recycling, marking the beginning of one of the biggest investments in recycling infrastructure. Question number two, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update regarding any support it is given to the renewable energy supply chain. Minister Ivan McKee. Renewable energy is a crucial element of our transition to deliver a net zero economy, and we are determined to maximise the economic opportunity for the Scottish supply chain for renewables, but especially offshore wind. We remain committed to using every lever within our devolved confidence to support 
and grow the supply chain here in Scotland. For offshore wind applicants to the Scotland leasing round were required to submit a supply chain development statement to Crown Estate Scotland, setting out the anticipated level and location of supply chain impact. In failure to deliver the commitments laid out in the final development statement can trigger remedies ranging from financial penalties to an inability to progress to seabed lease. David Torrance. Would the Minister agree that the Scottish supply sector and its skilled workforce has a huge export of opportunities? And can the Minister highlight how the Scottish Government is promoting and supporting the renewable sector to expand into international markets? Minister. Uh, I would agree. The Scottish Government recognises the huge potential within the renewable sector to support uh, the growth and resilience of the Scottish economy by increasing its reach to international trade. And that is why we are committed to working with the industry to develop a renewables sector export plan in 2022 as part of the delivery of a trading nation, our export growth plan and the national strategy for economic transformation. Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. The story of this industry is too often a story of broken promises, offshore jobs and neglected supply chains. I'm sure the Minister will agree that it does not have to be that way. Will the Minister consider new conditions on support for the sector, guaranteeing that a minimum percentage of jobs created with Scottish Government support remain in the Scottish economy? And for example, does he think it is reasonable, as the GMB trade union insists, that at least 50 per cent of manufacturing and fabrication jobs in offshore wind, a sector that the Scottish Government do support, should be located in Scotland, securing well-paid work and supporting our supply chains? Minister. Uh, we want to maximise the number of jobs uh, in the supply chain that are in Scotland. That is why we are putting in place the supply chain development statements to drive developers to use local supply chain. That is why we are putting in place the £75 million Energy Transition Fund and the £180 million Emerging Energy Technologies Fund. That is why we are working with the sector, as I do through uh, being co-chair of the Scottish Offshore Wind Energy Council, working with uh, Deep Wind and the uh, Forth and Tay Clusters to identify Scottish businesses that can benefit from these supply chain opportunities and working with uh, Scottish Renewables to identify Scottish businesses that we can develop along with Scotland's ports to be able to maximise the amount of that work that uh, takes place in Scotland and working with key global inward investors, as I do and my colleagues do on a regular basis, to bring their uh, capability to Scotland so they can employ people in Scotland manufacturing those products here rather than elsewhere. All of this, of course, we have to do while remaining compliant with, uh, with state aid rules. Question number three, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many people in central Scotland have been helped onto the property ladder through government schemes since 2016-17. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The shared equity schemes are one of a number of ways we are uh, supporting individuals to access affordable housing, as set out in our Housing to 2040 strategy. A total of 31,363 homes have been purchased in Scotland via the Scottish Government Shared Equity Scheme, which include the Open Market Shared Equity Scheme, New Supply Shared Equity, First Home Fund and Help to Buy Scotland. Of these, uh, 25,302 homes were in central Scotland. This figure represents completed purchases in the past five financial years and covers the number of homes rather than individual people. Mark Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The, the numbers being supported through the lift scheme, now the only one available, have tumbled in recent years, though, from 126 across the Central Scotland Councils in 2017-18 to just 12 in 2021. And I think the Cabinet Secretary has agreed to meet with Cal Grievers, who can't find um, a home that meets the lift requirements and is now crowdfunding for a deposit. Now, will the Cabinet Secretary agree to use this summer to look at enhancing lift to revisit the decisions um, from last summer to close the Help to Buy and First Home Fund scheme things? I think the advice that was based on was because lift made up 20 per cent of the affordable housing numbers, but now that figure has tumbled to just 14 per cent in 2021. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so let me first of all say um, to Matt Griffin that, of course, I, I do want to meet Callum Grievers, and I recognise two particular aspects about his case. First of all, uh, are about his particular needs, but secondly, some of the difficulties within the Edinburgh housing market. Um, but looking beyond that, in a more general sense across Scotland, um, first-time buyer activity has, has shown a strong recovery. 
um, and mortgage approvals for first-time buyers uh, in Scotland increased by 13% for the 12-month period in, uh, to quarter 1 uh, 2022 compared to quarter 1 2021. And of course, these schemes were set up to support buyers at a time when mortgage lenders were less likely to lend to those with a smaller deposit. And what we've seen is a, a steady recovery in the higher loan-to-value mortgage market, which means that the interventions we require uh, have, have changed. Now, against the financial backdrop, we've had to prioritise the available funds that we do have. And that has meant we've focused our support on uh, support for low-income buyers buyers, those that are most marginal, by maintaining the lift scheme. So essentially uh, putting money to those people who would otherwise not be able to afford home ownership. Now, there's no equivalent scheme run for low-income purchasers um, in, uh, by the UK government. And we feel this is the, the right balance uh, to strike. But of course, always happy uh, to look at the, some of the individual circumstances. And I think Callum Grievers highlights some particular issues that I'm wanting to meet to discuss and to look how we might help to uh, take some of those issues forward. Question number four, Marie McNair. Thank you, Ms. Lyon Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to protect communities from excessive aircraft noise. Minister Mary McCallum. Presiding Officer, we recognise the impact aircraft noise can have on communities, particularly those around runways. Major airports are required to put in place and take reasonable steps to deliver a plan to mitigate this impact and that under the Environmental Noise Scotland regulations of 2006. Um, they must update this plan every five years in consultation with communities. And as we enter the, the busy summer period, we encourage airports to engage effectively with local communities to consider how best to mitigate noise impact. However, it's always worth reminding ourselves that uh, our connectivity is increasingly being provided by latest generation aircraft, which are quieter and cleaner. Marie McNair. I thank the Minister for that answer. I can advise the Minister that I'm meeting with uh, Glasgow Airport's constituents in my constituency have uh, contacted me to express concerns that plans to mitigate the aircraft noise are insufficient in Clybank and Mogai. I support them when they express these concerns. Can the Minister outline the importance the Scottish Government places on the need for local communities to be at the heart of mitigation plans? Minister. Thanks, uh, Presiding Officer. And yes, I'm absolutely happy to. Um, engaging with local communities on noise mitigation measures is very important, and I'd encourage airports to continue to do this as they deliver and update their noise action plans. Um, I'm pleased to learn that Glasgow Airport will be setting up a noise action forum, which will include representatives from the community. And I'm also pleased to hear that they will shortly be meeting with the member. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The Minister will be aware that there was a, a long-awaited airspace redesign around Edinburgh Airport had to be abandoned following the pandemic, and effectively the airport put back to square one. This included much-needed offset departures over the village of Cramond, which would have reduced uh, noises in my West Edinburgh constituency. Um, can I ask the Minister what, what, what discussions she is having with Edinburgh Airport and the Civil Aviation Authority about assisting them in getting back to that place where they had to leave off? Minister. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, the specific issue that Alec Cole-Hamilton raises is not one that rests squarely within my ministerial portfolio, but I'm more than happy to speak with my colleagues, discover which of us has been dealing with that, and get them to engage directly with Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you. Question number five, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what proportion of electricity generated in Scotland in 2020 was from nuclear? Minister Richard Lockhead. In 2020, 25.7% of Scotland's electricity was generated by nuclear. Liam Kerr. Thank the Minister for the answer. According to the Climate Change Committee's Net Zero, the UK's contribution to stopping global warming report, to hit net zero, the UK will need four times more clean power by 2050. They further say that 38% of that needs to be firm power. That means consistently generated and reliable, regardless of weather conditions or battery life. So, Minister, from what source will Scotland get that 38% of firm electricity generation, please? Yeah. Minister. Can, can I say to the member uh, that uh, actually so far this year only 19% of electricity has been sourced from nuclear, and just last week wind power contributed a record amount of electricity to Britain's needs, meeting half, if half of the, the, uh, these islands' electricity needs uh, one day alone uh, last week. 
the view of this government is that nu nuclear is not the answer to Scotland's energy security or energy needs. It is uh, far too expensive, yeah. it will take years, yeah. and there remains safety and environmental concerns. Absolutely. And Scotland's future is based on their abundance of natural resources and renewable electricity yeah. and renewable energy. The amount of renewable electricity generated in Scotland in 2021 was the equivalent of powering all households in Scotland for almost three years, and that is Scotland's future. Kenneth Gibson. <laughs> point, point of order, Liam Kerr. Forgive me, President Officer, but I asked a straight question about where the 38% of firm electricity is going to come from. The Minister didn't even attempt to answer that question, which is just not a good reflection on the Minister or this Parliament. I wonder if he might be given another opportunity. The, the, the Minister has been given an opportunity to answer that question. The content of contributions is not a matter for me, but of course, um, under the Code of Conduct, um, which insists on courtesy and respect uh, amongst members for one another, it is obviously clear that we expect answers to be as responsive as possible. And I call Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Hunterson Bay and my constituency ceased electricity generation in January. So asking about 2020 output is surely irrelevant. Does the Minister agree that with Austria's energy minister raising the spectre of, and I quote, severe accidents with high releases, close quotes, at Sizewell C to be built in Suffolk due to the reactor design, we should not be considering new nuclear fission generation in Scotland? Minister. Well, the member is quite right to highlight some of the serious concerns that are expressed about the safety and indeed environmental implication of nuclear technologies. And that's why the Scottish Government doesn't support the building of any new nuclear power stations in Scotland and it will not feature as part of our wider energy strategy review that will take place later this year. And we will continue to assess any new technologies based on safety, value for customers and their contribution to Scotland's low carbon economy and energy future. Question number six, Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its deposit return scheme. Minister Mary McCallum. Presiding officer, we are implementing an ambitious deposit return scheme which will be the first in the UK and go live from 16 August next year. I'm delighted that the Scottish National Investment Bank and Bank of Scotland have announced a total of £18 million loan funding for Circularity Scotland. It's a tremendous vote of confidence in our DRS and in them as the scheme administrator. Recently, Circularity Scotland has also published details of the handling fee that will be paid to retailers operating a return point and the specification for reverse vending machines. Confirming these details is a major step forward and will allow industry to move ahead with its preparations. Daniel Johnson. I am grateful to the Minister for that answer. Indeed, it is to do with the Scottish National Investment Bank funding that I would like to address my supplementary question. I think many people will be surprised that the deposit return scheme was receiving funding from this source, given that the National Investment Bank was meant to be about strategic uh, uh, priorities, addressing market failure and driving uh, enterprise. So is it appropriate to be funding public policy through this means, especially given the Scottish National Investment Bank's funding will decline to zero in the time frame of the resource spending review as announced yesterday? Minister. Presiding officer, as I assume Daniel Johnson is aware, uh, investments decisions of the Scottish National Investment Bank are taken entirely independently of ministers. However, given the opportunity uh, to talk about DRS today, I am very pleased to reiterate it will go live in August next year. When it does so, it will be the first in the UK. It will be the most environmentally ambitious and accessible in the, in the EU. It will sit alongside landmark investment of £70 million in recycling infrastructure. And uh, on today of all days, as Scotland becomes the first country in the UK to ban some of the most problematic single-use plastics, it will make an enormous contribution to our environmental and our anti-litter objectives. Question number seven, Jim Fairley. Uh, thanks, President. Officer, I'd like to ask the Scottish Government what support is available to local authorities to encourage the development of district heating systems in conjunction with the incineration of waste rather than sending waste to landfill. Minister Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. In February, we launched our £300 million heat network fund, uh, which helps local authorities and private companies uh, to develop heat networks, including making use of existing waste heat where possible. Uh, we currently support heat network projects in Aberdeen and Midlothian that will use waste heat from energy from waste. However, it is important that waste heat producers decarbonise their operations to ensure that we meet our net zero target. And we recently also published the independent review of incineration, 
which recommended that the Scottish Government sets an indicative cap for the amount of residual waste treatment needed. We will be setting out a response to that report in June. Jim Fairley. I would like to thank the Minister for that answer. I recently attended a CPG on Nordic countries and was very interested to hear from Morten Dudal from the Danish Board of the District Heating, who told us that around 50 per cent of Danish heat demand is serviced by district heating and heat networks. In my own constituents of Perth, South and Kinrosia, there are plans for an energy from waste plant at Bin Eco Park. So can the Minister say how areas in Scotland have invested in such systems and how communities can consume the energy or heat that is produced in their locality? And is this local production to be consumed via the national grid? Minister. Mr Fairley is, is right to point to the much more extensive use of heat networks in some other European countries. Currently, uh, upwards of 1.18 terawatt hours of heat is supplied by heat networks in Scotland. We want to see significant growth so that by the end of this decade, six terawatt hours of heat is supplied by networks. And we recently published the, the first national assessment of potential heat network zones to identify areas in which heat network deployment could be most effective. We are providing £300 million via Scotland's heat network fund to develop heat networks, which could, if well located, utilise waste heat. And in some places, existing waste from energy plants may be in a position to supply both uh, heat to heat networks and electricity to the grid. However, we need to be clear that the growth of heat networks is not contingent on increasing the availability of heat from this particular source. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And could I start with how we are now more regularly starting to do these proceedings by wishing Steve Clark and the team all the very best tonight. It is a major it is a major game as the Scottish National Men's team are now just two matches away from potentially qualifying for the World Cup for the first time since 1998. And I know the whole Parliament will wish them well, the players on the pitch, the manager, the team around them and of course the outstanding Tartan army who will be roaring them on to victory tonight. And we wish them all the very best. Can I ask the First Minister, in the middle of a cost of living crisis, with so many families struggling, why is her government allocating another £20 million for an independence referendum? First Minister. Presiding officer, can I uh, also begin uh, by taking the opportunity to wish Steve Clark and the team every success at Hamden this evening. I um, will be there cheering on Scotland. We all want Scotland to win and to qualify for the first uh, World Cup we would be at in a long, long time. Uh, that said, uh, I think I can speak for uh, everybody at Hamden this evening uh, when I say that uh, no matter how strongly we will be supporting Scotland, a bit of all of our hearts will be with Ukraine uh, as we continue to stand in solidarity with Ukraine in this hour of need. Um, and just as the Tartan Army... Just as... The Tartan Army this evening will, as it always does, belt out Flower of Scotland. I hope we also stand and show real passion for the Ukraine yeah. national anthem as well this evening. But good luck to Steve um, and to the team. Um, and can I also take the opportunity to thank Douglas Ross? Uh, can I thank Douglas Ross warmly uh, for giving me the opportunity today to set out exactly why giving the people of Scotland an opportunity to choose a better future yeah. is so important yeah. wow. at this particular uh, moment in time. Uh, the resource spending review that Kate Forbes set out yesterday in many ways uh, sets out the very heavy price that people across Scotland are paying right now for continued Westminster yeah. decision making. Yeah. UK government decisions have cut our budget this year, by more than 5% in real terms, they will constrain growth in our budget over the next four years to 2%, while inflation is close to 10%. Inflation in the UK, of course, which, thanks to the folly of Brexit, is the highest of any G7 country. Every year right now, the Scottish Government is having to invest more than 700 million pounds mitigating the impact of Westminster policies that Scotland did not vote for. The bedroom tax, the rate clause, the removal of universal credit, plunging more people into poverty. So yes, presiding officer, 
I think that £20 million, 0.05%, one half of one tenth of one percent of the entire Scottish Government budget to give the people of this country the opportunity to choose a better future, yes, is and will be a really good investment. Yeah. Dr. Shaw. The First Minister's answer never once mentioned the cost of living crisis no. that no. Scots are facing right now. Never once even attempted to address that issue. She gets very excited, very animated, speaking about independence and dividing our country all over again. But not a single word to the people struggling right now who do not understand why her government is prioritising another independence referendum. Because spending £20 million on a divisive referendum in the middle of a cost of living crisis is shameful. Yeah. Nicola Sturgeon's eye is off the ball all over again. Yeah. She is obsessing about independence when people across Scotland overwhelmingly want the members, focus members, to members, Mr. Ross, members, please resist the urge to heckle from a sedentary position, Mr. Ross. She's obsessing about independence when people across Scotland overwhelmingly want the focus to be on the issues that really matter to them. Yeah. So let's look at that twenty million pounds. That could pay for more police officers, mm -hmm. more teachers, more nurses. It could pay more support for people facing rising energy bills and higher costs at the supermarket. Charging ahead with a plan to divide us is the wrong priority when now, more than ever, we need to pull together using the strength and security we get as part of the United Kingdom to see us through the cost of living crisis just like it saw us through the COVID pandemic. Yeah. First Minister, just how much worse does the cost of living crisis have to get for individuals right across Scotland before you will divert money away from an independence referendum? First Minister. Douglas Ross stood up and said, I didn't mention the cost of living crisis. Can I uh, suggest that Douglas Ross might want to consider what it is that is causing the cost of living crisis. It is soaring inflation. As I said in my answer, inflation that in the UK, thanks in large part to the utter folly of Brexit imposed upon Scotland by Tory uh, governments, is the highest of any G7 country. That is part of the price of Westminster government. It is a Tory created cost of living crisis. And how much, how much worse does it have to get before the Conservatives take it seriously and provide real, proper help to people across this country? And Douglas Ross stands here and asks me about £20 million, as I said, one half of one tenth of one percent of the entire Scottish budget, to give the people of this country the option of a better future. Douglas Ross never stands here, um, as he should and apologises for the fact that this government every year is required to invest more than £700 yeah. million pounds yeah. to mitigate Tory policies that we yeah. in Scotland don't vote for. That's to mitigate the awful rape clause imposed on Scotland by the Tories. That's to mitigate the awful bedroom tax yeah. imposed on Scotland by the Tories. That's to mitigate the poverty that Tory policies are plunging so many yep. people into, to mitigate the austerity uh, that we heard uh, the Glasgow Centre for Population Health Research say it has caused a stalling in improved life expectancy in Scotland and across the UK. So yes, I do think £20 million to give Scotland the choice uh, of a better future, a Tory free future, is a good yeah. investment. Um, and let's, let's lastly, presiding officer, although if we look at the opinion poll, Scot uh, presiding officer, I suspect Scotland's uh, well on the way back to being Tory free anyway. Uh, but can we say this? Let's, let's, remind, let's remind ourselves that thanks to this government, we have more police officers in Scotland. Yep. Thanks to this government, yep. Uh, we have more primary school yeah. teachers than at any time since 1980. Uh, so I'll go on with the job of delivering for Scotland. And yes, I hope freeing Scotland from continued Westminster Tory government. <laughs> I mean, the, 
the, the First Minister now just makes it up as she goes along. Yeah. She's saying yeah. that the UK, the UK government is doing nothing to help people. £37 billion yeah. Yeah. investment in this country Absolutely. to help those who are struggling. Eight million people of the lowest earners across Scotland will get at least £1,200 in additional support announced by exactly. the Chancellor just last week. And despite, again, what the First Minister tried to say in her first answer, we know that her government has received the biggest block grant from the UK government ever, and they have squandered it. The spending review shows the real cost of the SNP's failures for the Scottish public. A fortune wasted on ferries, mm -hmm. on Bifa, on Prestwick Airport, mm -hmm. failures at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. The list goes on and on and on. And the consequences of those failures for our country are devastating. The Institute for Fiscal Studies says the next few years will mean, and I quote from them, really big cuts in planned spending on public services. First Minister, because of your government's failures, we are facing severe cuts to budgets for the police prisons, schools, councils, rural affairs, enterprise, tourism and higher education. Scotland is paying the price for Nicola Sturgeon's mistakes. The spending review was damning. Doesn't this all show that we are facing the worst financial outlook from a Scottish government since devolution? First Minister, it's issues in turn, uh, presenting officer. Let's firstly look at the, the help uh, announced by the Chancellor uh, last week, um, and I'll just say in passing, it is deeply regrettable that it took yet again the party gate yeah. crisis that yeah. Boris Johnson yeah. wanted to divert attention from for the Chancellor to lift a single finger. But if, you take the, if you take the universal support, the £400, uh, welcome though that is, it is a fraction of the projected increase in energy costs that families across the country are facing. Uh, you take uh, the support for the lowest income families, again, very welcome, but it doesn't even come close to putting back the £1,000 taken out of the pockets of lowest income families, uh, given the, the clawback of the universal credit £20 a week. Uh, so there is much, much more needs to be done from the UK government. And secondly, on uh, the Scottish Government's block uh, grant, and wouldn't it be better, actually, if we be, had responsibility for raising our own revenue than, rather than having to rely on a block grant from someone else? But Douglas Ross says it's the biggest ever. This year, Scotland's budget, because of Westminster Tory decisions, is reduced in real terms by 5.2%. So if that's the biggest ever, I'm not sure that's much for the Tories to crow about. Um, and next, Douglas Ross says that uh, spending money to save Bifab, to save Ferguson's, to save Presswick Airport is wasted money. Well, I think that says everything we need to know about the Tory approach to jobs. They don't care about people's jobs. So yesterday, finally, presiding officer, Kate Forbes uh, set out ambitious plans uh, backing our priorities of tackling child poverty, of protecting public services, of moving to net zero and supporting the economy. Do I wish we had more money to allocate? Yes, I do. But this government's budget is largely determined by decisions taken by the Tories. And therefore, everything Douglas Ross has just said actually makes the argument, doesn't detract from the argument, it makes the argument for this parliament, this country, becoming independent. Yeah. First Minister, stop running from your failures and start to own them. Yay! This blaming the Westminster bogeyman doesn't cut it with the public who are struggling because your decisions are devastating for the people of Scotland. The SNP, the Scottish Government, are the ones running our finances into the ground. And all we've heard from the First Minister today is they've got cash for another referendum but cuts for Scotland's public services. Yeah. And the most damaging cuts are going to be on Scotland's young people. The First Minister used to grandstand and she said she would close the attainment gap between rich and poor. How's that going, First Minister? She promised to make education her number one priority. How's that going, First Minister? The Scottish public were told to judge her on education. 
Well, she's failed, and now she's given up even trying. Yeah. The education budget is being slashed to the bone. Yep. The First Minister likes to talk about Scotland's future. Well, we want money invested in Scotland's future, but on schools, not on separation. Yeah. First Minister, why put £20 million behind your push for another referendum when it could be spent on delivering opportunities for our young people across Scotland? Yeah. First Minister. Officer, it is, of course, just a fact uh, that the size of this Parliament's budget is largely decided by decisions taken at Westminster. And if Douglas Ross doesn't like the outcome of that, then perhaps he should have a word uh, with his bosses at Westminster, or better still, support this Parliament and this country having full financial responsibility. <laughs> and he asked me. He asked me, how is the work to close the attainment gap in education going? So I'm delighted to give him a progress report on that today, and he doesn't have to take my word for it. Let me quote the Commissioner for Fair Access just yesterday, talking about uh, the progress in closing the attainment gap in access to university. Uh, what the Commissioner said is that the work of the Scottish Government has been, and I am quoting, an unambiguous success and Scotland is now leading the UK. So there's your progress report on education. Of course, presenting officer, we know the real uh, reason for all uh, of Douglas Ross's bluster today. And let me just, before I go on to that real reason, let me just reiterate... First Minister, if I may stop you a moment, I have already asked for members to resist the urge to make a contribution when it is not their turn to speak. I would be grateful if you could bear that in mind. First Minister. So just let me reiterate for the avoidance of doubt, if spending £20 million wins this country a better future, a future where we don't have to spend £700 million mitigating Tory policies, then yes, that is a good investment. But the reason for Douglas Ross's bluster, of course, is that we know that the Tories and Douglas Ross are not very popular amongst the Scottish people. But we now know, as of this week, that Douglas Ross has never been less popular with Conservative voters. He's now, for the first time, got negative uh, approval ratings. And Douglas Ross is in the unenviable position, presiding officer, uh, of the only Tory who is less popular amongst Conservative voters now than Douglas Ross is Boris Johnson. No wonder he's in a bit of a state today. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Officer, tonight, almost everyone in the world will be supporting Ukraine, and if they were playing any other, other country in the world, I would probably be supporting them too. Uh, but as they are playing us, uh, I will be cheering on Scotland and the Tartan Army. So can I wish uh, Steve Clark, Andy Robertson and the entire Scotland men's football team all the very best for tonight. Uh, I hope they can take us to a World Cup. Uh, officer, can the First Minister tell the Chamber how many people were on an NHS waiting list a year into an SNP government? pre-pandemic in March 2020, and how many Scots are on an NHS waiting list now? First Minister. I will provide the uh, precise figures. Um, I do not have them to hand. What I do know is that there are more people on NHS waiting lists uh, now, post-pandemic, uh, than will have been the case uh, at uh, many points over recent years. And that is the case uh, not only in Scotland, uh, but it is the case uh, across the UK um, and across much of the world uh, because of the pressures uh, of COVID. Um, I also know that before uh, we had the pandemic, there was significant progress being uh, made in reducing waiting time. So if we take outpatients, for example, before the pandemic, uh, the number waiting for a first outpatient appointment had reduced by 21.3%. Uh, over the same period, the numbers waiting for uh, over 12 weeks for an outpatient appointment uh, had fallen by more than 30 percent uh, more uh, appointments have been carried out in terms of the inpatient treatment time guarantee and the number waiting over six weeks for one of the eight diagnostic tests were down 25 percent. So that's the progress that was being made that has been clearly set back by the pandemic, which is why our recovery plan and the significant additional investment going into the NHS is so important. Anna Sarwar. Yeah, the First Minister doesn't need to send me the stats. I've got them uh, for her right here. The answer the First Minister was looking for was there were over 260,000 people on an NHS waiting list a year into an SNP government. That had risen to almost 420,000 on a waiting list pre-pandemic in March 2020. 
And today that stands at over 708,000 people, one in eight Scots on an NHS waiting list. And the First Minister references the recovery plan or catch-up plan. Surely catch-up means the number waiting would go down instead of going up. But there are nearly 60,000 more people on an NHS waiting list compared to when the government announced the catch-up plan back in August. So let me try another one. How many people were waiting over a year for inpatient treatment when the First Minister took office, and how many people are waiting over a year today? First Minister. Uh, there are more people waiting over a year today, and uh, I think most people understand that that is because of the impact of the pandemic. And in fact, the latest quarterly figures show uh, an increase in people seen inpatients, outpatients, and diagnostic procedures uh, compared to the previous quarter, which again shows the impact of the improvement and catch-up work that is being done. But of course, uh, we are still in, we're in a much better uh, position, but we are still in a pandemic. And since the recovery plan was published, we've had another wave uh, of the pandemic. Um, I think uh, people understand uh, the impact that that is having in our NHS, but they also see the increased number of people working in our NHS, they see the increased investment in our NHS, uh, and they will uh, start to see uh, the increase in terms of numbers seen, um, and yes, that impact on waiting times. Uh, but regardless of what party is in government across the UK, SNP in Scotland, uh, the Tories in England, Labour in Wales, the NHS is uh, facing the same challenges, but of course on many of these measures, the NHS in Scotland is doing better uh, than the other UK nations. Anna Sarwar. I have already re referenced to the First Minister that the figures are going up since the catch-up plan, not coming down in terms of those on waiting lists. And, 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 uh, as is typical when the First Minister is struggling, she wants to talk about Wales. I remind her she is paid to care about the people of Scotland uh, because she is Scotland's First Minister. But here is the, here's the answer the First Minister could not give or does not want to give. Uh, and let us remember that there is a legal guarantee of treatment, a legal guarantee for treatment within 12 weeks. The number of people waiting over a year when Nicola Sturgeon took office was 21. As of today, that number is over 30,000 of our fellow Scots waiting over a year, not the legal 12 weeks, waiting over a year for inpatient treatment like a hip replacement, a knee replacement or a heart operation. So let's look at Nicola Sturgeon's record on the NHS. She's broken her own treatment time law 490,000 times. She's cut over 4,000 beds out of our NHS, and on her watch, we now have record vacancies for nurses and midwives. We are 6,000 nurses and midwives short. This is a litany of failures, a black hole in our public finances, railways that don't run, ferries that don't sail, and soaring waiting lists in our NHS. Which one is Nicola Sturgeon most ashamed of? First Minister. I am proud of the work that this government does to support the NHS. I am proud of the fact that there are thousands more people working in our NHS and I am proud of the fact that I think the NHS budget has increased by about 90 per cent in cash terms since this government uh, took office. But Anna Sarwar literally, literally must be the only person in the country, perhaps the only person on the planet that does not understand or is not willing uh, to understand the impact of a global pandemic on health services in Scotland and around uh, the world. We were seeing significant improvements before the pandemic, the pandemic when we literally had to pause surgery and other treatments in the NHS has clearly set that back and now we are investing uh, and introducing the initiatives to catch uh, up on that progress. Anna Sauer also mentions uh, beds and I know he does not like comparisons uh, to Wales uh, when they do not suit him. But the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, of course, who were talking uh, about bed numbers this week and said important things, uh, also pointed out uh, that Scotland has a higher number of beds per head of population uh, than Wales and England. Uh, so, yes, we have lots of work to do, Members. Uh, but we have a better foundation to build on uh, than where Labour is in government in the rest of the UK. We will now move to constituency and general supplementaries and I call Eleanor Whittam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask for the First Minister's response to the research she referenced earlier, published by Glasgow University and the Glasgow Centre for Population Health yesterday, which has suggested people across the UK are dying younger as a result of UK government austerity? First Minister. 
Um, I think it's appalling and it displays and gives evidence for uh, what I think many of us have suspected is the case over uh, some time now. Um, what the researchers at the Glasgow Centre for Population Health uh, found is, and I'm quoting here, austerity is highly likely to be the most substantial causal contributor to the solved mortality trends seen in Scotland and across the UK. Uh, so it's down to Tory austerity. Tory austerity, remember, that was kicked off by Labour uh, under the last Labour uh, government. And we now see the impact of that on people across the country, which is another uh, reason for wanting to get members, a, better future, members. a better future for Scotland. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, there is an inequality across my region when it comes to supporting children with complex needs during the summer. Robin Holland from the National Autistic Society Scotland has said the lack of services heaps further pressure on families and risks pushing them to breaking point. The availability of short-term break services should not be wholly reliant on where autistic children live. What action is the Scottish Government putting in place to rectify this postcode lottery for which autistic children have to endure? First Minister. I agree with uh, the member that children with autism should have access to uh, good services regardless of where they live in Scotland. Uh, and of course, we would expect uh, to see local authorities ensure uh, that that is the case. Our duty, uh, which is one we take seriously, is to support local authorities financially and in other ways. And I'm happy to uh, ask the Education Secretary to look at the situation in the region uh, that the member represents and uh, write to him in greater detail. But I hope all local authorities uh, take the responsibility to support uh, children to catch up their education very seriously. Alex Cole Hamilton. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. This morning we learned that the number of people suffering from long COVID has risen to 155,000. Presiding Officer, that's almost one in 30 Scots. And last weekend, Dr Kevin Deans told BBC Scotland that the need for long COVID clinics was absolute and it was urgent. We cannot not do this, he said. His intervention destroys the baffling arguments from SNP and Green benches that clinics would somehow get in the way of support. Presiding officer, the First Minister is devoting twice as much money to her referendum as she is to this awful condition. So can I ask her, what does she have to say to the 155,000 sufferers, many of whom are children, and will she revisit the issue of long COVID clinics today? First Minister. The first thing I would say is that Alec Cole Hamilton shouldn't uh, certainly misrepresent my position here. I have not said uh, that clinics get in the way uh, of other support. The argument I have made and will continue to make is that there is a range of support that health boards need to put in place and uh, long COVID clinics uh, may well be part of that and that is for health boards to consider. Uh, so we will continue uh, to provide funding uh, for health boards and support for health boards, including research support uh, to enable clinicians and others uh, to continue to develop their understanding of long COVID and the impact that it has. Uh, this is something we do take seriously and we will continue to take seriously, uh, given, uh, and Alec Cole Hamilton is right to point this out, the significant numbers of people who are living with long COVID uh, and who are likely to continue to do so for much time to come. Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Last May, the SNP government pledged a replacement for the Erasmus scheme to ensure that over 15,000 students every year from across Scotland have the chance to experience life, learning and culture abroad. The First Minister has described the removal of the scheme as cultural vandalism. The Welsh Labour Replacement Scheme starts this September. I know, she's, I know, and I know the First Minister is very keen on the comparison. So here, so here First Minister, is the comparison. The spending review yesterday confirmed... Can we hear Mr Mara, please? I know, I know, presiding officer, that the First Minister is very keen on the comparison with Wales. The spending review yesterday confirms that the SNP scheme will not open until 2026, five years after the promise was made. How can the First Minister justify this astonishing delay to the 75,000 Scots who will miss out forever? 
First Minister. I, I'm not sure if that was a, a leadership bid that was being launched by Michael Mara there or if it was an entirely inadvertent attempt to undermine his leader, who's just told me that we should never talk about Wales in this chamber. Uh, so perhaps Michael Mara will want to clarify that in the future. Um, we remain committed. Uh, we remain committed. And actually, and I, I can say this unashamedly, we uh, have and will continue to look at the example in Wales. Uh, we remain committed to an alternative to Erasmus and we'll set out further details uh, of that in due course. But I tell you what else I am committed uh, to, and that is to see Scotland uh, rejoin the yeah. European Union yeah. as an independent nation so that we don't have to have we don't have to have a second best alternative yeah. to Erasmus. We can be back in the actual Erasmus scheme benefiting young people for generations to come. Thank you. Um, there are eight higher um, and further education institutes, nine including the Open University in my uh, constituency of Glasgow Kelvin. And as a former teacher, access to higher education and increasing opportunities is a cause that's close to my heart. As schools and colleges are finishing this year's National Qualifications Exam Diet, can I ask the First Minister for her response to the report published yesterday by the Commissioner for Fair Access? First Minister. I very much welcome the report published yesterday by the Commissioner for Fair Access. Um, it is, of course, this government's ambition that every child growing up in Scotland, regardless of their background, should have an equal chance of going to university. So I very much welcome Sir Peter Scott's recognition of the excellent progress uh, that has been made. Uh, and indeed, I appreciate his role in delivering this outcome. Um, let me acknowledge, since this was his final report yesterday, I want to acknowledge my thanks for his commitment uh, during his time as Commissioner in progressing access to higher education for those from the most deprived areas. Uh, the number of entrants on full-time first-year courses from the 20 per cent most deprived communities has increased 39 per cent since Sir Peter Scott took on his role. And the Scottish Government will consider all of his recommendations carefully and respond in due course. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Universities Scotland have warned that eight of Scotland's universities are set to receive cuts to research funding this year. With four high-performing research institutions facing decrease of greater than one million from August, can I ask the First Minister, with 85 per cent of Scottish research being rated as world-leading or internationally excellent, why is her government cutting funding to this vital work? Yeah. First Minister. We will continue to support our universities. We will continue to support fair access to our universities. And of course, we will continue to support the world-leading research that happens in our universities. But it is a bit galling uh, to hear a Conservative member uh, stand here and talk about the threats to university research when the biggest threat uh, and the uh, reality for universities has been that Brexit yeah, yeah. Um, has yeah. damaged their research potential. Uh, so perhaps uh, the Conservatives want to look to themselves before they start raising questions uh, for others on university research. Poisel Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I recently raised with the First Minister the case of a constituent who had waited seven months to diagnose with an aggressive form of cancer. We now hear from the ICBP and Cancer Research UK that almost two-fifths of cancer in Scotland are only being diagnosed at A&D. I hear this week from Myeloma UK that in the case of myeloma, this can be up to the third. How can the Scottish Government reassure my constituents that they will not be made to wait dangerously long for cancer diagnosis? First Minister. Uh, we are already investing, of course, in early diagnostic centres for cancer. Uh, and, of course, uh, we have the Detect Cancer Early programme that we have invested in for some time and uh, continue to invest in. I absolutely agree with the member. Early diagnosis for all cancers is uh, vital and it's really important that we do everything uh, to support that, but also encourage people uh, who have symptoms uh, that could be indicative of cancer to come forward uh, to see a doctor as quickly as possible. And we'll continue uh, to do everything possible uh, to support that early access, because we know the earlier uh, somebody is diagnosed, uh, the better chances they have of survival and recovery. Ross Greer. 
Thank you. The First Minister will be aware of the long-running campaign to prevent Yorkshire theme park operators from Ingleland from developing what they describe as a luxury tourist resort on the banks of Loch Lomond at Balloch. Our successful campaign to defeat their first application saw a record 60,000 objections lodged, citing damage to ancient woodland, risk to protected species, strain on local roads, access to local residents and a range of other concerns. Sadly, though, from Ingleland are back, having just lodged a new application. Does the First Minister agree that our national parks are for all of us and that it would be unacceptable for one of the most accessible locations on Loch Lomond to be closed off to all but the select few who will pay to stay at this resort? First Minister. Well, obviously, the Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park Authority is responsible for considering planning applications within the national park, and therefore it would not uh, be appropriate for me to comment on the specifics of any planning application and indeed not helpful uh, for me to do so. Uh, I do, however, note that any development must comply with Scottish planning policy and the local development plan for the National Park and that any development must also be in keeping with the Park Authority's statutory aims. It is for the Park Authority to fully consider the application and assess the balance between the impact of the proposed development on the environment um, with any potential benefits. Question number three, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Training Officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is regarding the impact on Scotland to the energy profits levy, commonly referred to as a windfall tax on the oil and gas sector to help support families struggling with the cost of the living crisis. First Minister. Well, after months of delay, the UK Government uh, belatedly conceded the need for a windfall tax to help those struggling to make ends meet action that the Scottish Government had been urging them to take. Uh, however, we have also made the point that oil and gas companies are not alone in profiting from recent global events and that a windfall tax should apply to all companies posting significantly higher profits. Uh, the Chancellor's failure to implement this fairly now means that Scottish industry is carrying a disproportionate burden of funding what is a UK-wide response, and it also means that the support available is still far too limited. By widening out and using the fiscal headroom available, the Chancellor could have gone beyond one-off measures and introduced long-term strategies, such as, for example, introducing an equivalent of the Scottish Child Payment. Stuart McMillan. I thank the First Minister for that reply. Would the First Minister agree with me that the limited actions last week by the Times that Rich List Chancellor Rishi Sunak, although welcome, do not go anywhere near far enough? The Tory cost of living crisis is real for millions across these islands, with food prices going up, which the ONS reported on this week, energy costs going up and expected to rise again in the autumn, and at the same time the UK Government's Department for Work and Pensions have underpaid claimants by almost £3 billion. Does the First Minister agree with me that the one thing the windfall tax shows is the strength of the Scottish economy, as 90 per cent of the revenue raised from the levy will be drawn from the profits made in Scotland, meaning that, not for the first time, Scotland's resources Sources are bankrolling the rest of the UK and demonstrating how much stronger position we would be in as an independent country. First Minister. In fact, I it may go as far as to say the broad shoulders of Scotland uh, are helping all of the UK <laughs> at this time. Uh, but Stuart McMillan is absolutely right. He's absolutely right, firstly, and this is extremely serious, to say that the help announced by the Chancellor, welcome though it was, does not go nearly far enough given the inflationary cost of living pressures that people are facing right now. And I hope uh, we see and hear very quickly further action from the Chancellor. Uh, he's also right to say that Scotland's economy, industry and resources are bearing a disproportionate burden to prop up uh, the UK Government's policies. Uh, we called for a windfall tax, but I think it would be better to see one that is fair and that applies to all companies that are benefiting from excess profits, uh, from current global events or from the pandemic. So I think the Chancellor has missed a trick with this watered-down levy uh, and, of course, left Scottish industry to foot the bill for the whole of the UK, not for the first time. Liam Kerr. Energy profits levy will also encourage investment in and the development of new fields like Cambo. Uh, does the First Minister agree that a growing and prosperous North Sea oil and gas sector is just what we need to support tens of thousands of jobs and fund the type of interventions to cut energy bills that she's just welcomed? Yeah. First Minister. Well, I think my, my position uh, on Cambo is well known, uh, but what I think we need to see, of course, is greater investment in renewables. Uh, Scotland's 
uh, potential in oil and gas over uh, the past five decades is matched now, of course, by our potential in renewable energy, not least offshore uh, wind. The Scottish Government is investing in that, and I think it would be far better to see the UK Government follow suit. Question number four, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government plans to address the reported potential spending gap of £3.5 billion in its budget by 2026-27. First Minister. Uh, well, of course, the spending review is balanced each year, so it's simply not true to claim that there is a £3.5 billion gap in our spending plans. Uh, what the spending review does show, however, is that in the face of rising inflation, our spending power will be significantly smaller in real terms than what was forecast just a few months ago. And what makes matters significantly worse is that the Tory government is denying Scotland both the powers and the resources to properly address this. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Finance Secretary confirmed yesterday that the Scottish Government's budget is today around £7 billion higher than was being forecast just four years ago. That is £7 billion extra from the UK Treasury that this Scottish Government was not expecting just four years ago. At the same time, both SPICE and the Institute for Fiscal Studies are telling us that we will see real terms cuts, thanks to this SNP Government's choices, real terms cuts of 8 per cent and more in the years ahead to education, to policing, to justice, to enterprise, to universities, to tourism, to trade promotion and to local government. How on earth did this SNP government manage to turn an extra £7 billion from Westminster into such savage cuts? First Minister. I think um, Murdo Fraser should probably think twice about quoting the IFS, since they had to take to Twitter this week to correct things that he was saying um, on social media. Uh, the, facts, the facts are deeply uncomfortable and inconvenient for the Conservatives, but they continue to be the facts. So this year, uh, and I believe these are actually Scottish Fiscal Commission figures, uh, the Scottish budget in real terms is 5.2 per cent less than it was uh, last year. And over the four years of the spending review, we will we'll hear grow the its First Minister. <coughs> First Minister. projected to grow um, in real terms by 2 per cent at a time when inflation is hitting uh, 10 per cent. So that is the reality. It is also the reality and the fact that the size of the Scottish Government's budget is largely determined by decisions taken at Westminster. So if he wants the Scottish Government to have a bigger budget, uh, then I'll say the same to him as I said to Douglas Ross. Uh, either have a word with your bosses at Westminster or better still, back this Parliament having full fiscal and financial control over our own budget. Budgets. Question number five, Sarah Boyer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what her position is on whether Scotland's Census 2022 has been a credible exercise. First Minister. Uh, yes, it has. Uh, NRS are confident that the national return rate and the coverage across the country, coupled with the normal planned uh, post-collection quality control and assurance work, will provide credible, high-quality outputs. Uh, as I have said previously, NRS are working with a number of statisticians and experts in census and administrative data to help steer uh, the work over the next few months, and the support and advice from the steering group will help NRS produce a high-quality census data set, one that will ultimately provide them with the right statistical outputs they need to inform future service planning. Sarah Boyack. When I asked the First Minister about the problems with this year's census last month, she said questions would need to be asked, including about the credibility of this census. We clearly now need answers about the timing of the census, how it was conducted, yeah. resourced and its accessibility. But now we know the response rate. Does the First Minister agree with my concerns? that people on lower incomes will now be doubly hit, given the importance of census data in targeting resources to invest in communities and tackle inequalities, and given the lower rates of return in disadvantaged communities across Scotland? And what action will she take to ensure that people will not miss out? First Minister. 
Of course, we will review experience and ensure that any lessons uh, that require to be learned uh, are learned, and I think it is important to repeat that. But it is also the case uh, that there is normal planned uh, work uh, that always follows uh, the census, uh, which is about the assurance of the credibility of the exercise. And NRS are now focused on that planned post-collection quality control and assurance work. Uh, that includes the census coverage survey, which is the second largest social research exercise in Scotland after the census itself. That involves door-to-door -door interviews with a sample of around 1.5% of the Scottish population, about 50,000 households. And that survey, alongside the use of other data, builds on the census returns so that the census outputs are representative of the whole of Scotland's population. And therefore, that does address the concern uh, about those in our more deprived communities. An expert steering group uh, of uh, experts has been established by the Registrar General to help steer uh, that work, and it's important that it now uh, gets on with it. Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Latest NRS numbers show that well over 1.5 million census field force address visits took place across Scotland in the lead-up to the deadline demonstrating a vast mobilisation and an incredible effort on the doorstep. I met with some census field force last Friday morning in air and spent some time knocking on the doors and discussing the challenges they've faced in recent weeks. Can the First Minister join me in expressing immense gratitude to those field staff who endured that the, endured that the return rate was as high and the data as sound as possible? First Minister. Well, can I thank uh, Siobhan Brown for her question, and I'm glad to hear she did take up the Registrar General's offer to meet uh, with the very hard-working census field force. Uh, over 1.66 million field force address visits took place, uh, including some multiple uh, visits, with field staff providing advice and support, uh, leaving calling cards, providing paper forms to householders and supporting doorstep data capture. So, yes, I do want to add my thanks to the hundreds of field staff who have worked tirelessly over the past few months, mobilising across the country and providing invaluable support to the people of Scotland. And let me also take the opportunity to thank the nearly 2.3 million households who have completed the census. Question number six, Julian Mackay. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the finding of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine report beds in the NHS, that since 2010, 4,227 hospital beds and taken out of active service in NHS Scotland. First Minister. Uh, we are committed to ensuring that the NHS has the right number of beds and staff to meet the needs of people across Scotland. We will continue to work with the Royal College of Emergency Medicine and other frontline staff with the aim of reducing unnecessary lengths of stay and avoiding unnecessary admissions to help increase capacity in hospital for those people who require it. The Royal College acknowledges that bed numbers prior to the pandemic have reduced, and I'm quoting, largely because of shortened hospital stay and the very real need to reduce the length of time that people stay in hospital and provide care for them uh, in as homely or at home an environment as possible. Uh, the report examines uh, bed reductions not only in Scotland but across England, Wales and Northern Ireland and finds that Scotland has uh, the higher number of beds per head of population with 3.6 beds per 1,000 population compared to just 3.3 in Wales and just 2.2 in England. Julian Mackay. One of the biggest issues facing hospitals is staffing pressures, and Brexit has worsened matters. Dr John Paul Lowry, Vice Chair of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, said yesterday that across the whole acute system, we have lost staff members who would have come to work in the UK or who have had to leave the UK because of the situation with Brexit. Does the First Minister agree with me that at a time when the NHS has faced and continues to face unprecedented pressure, Brexit, which Scotland overwhelmingly rejected, has made those pressures so much worse. And can she outline how the Scottish Government and NHS Scotland are working together to address the situation? First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, I very much agree with that. Um, before I address the issue of staff shortages, uh, let me just uh, complete my answer in terms of bed numbers. It is uh, important and a, a big responsibility of government working with health boards to ensure that we have an appropriate number of beds uh, in the National Health Service. But Gillian Mackay is absolutely right to say that one of the biggest challenges facing uh, health and social care uh, is staff shortages. Indeed, 
Uh, Dr Lowry uh, described the situation uh, as, a, and I'm quoting again, a real problem and a real challenge. Uh, we should be in no doubt that Brexit has put unnecessary and harmful obstacles in the way of potential new members of staff joining from the European Union, particularly in relation to social care roles. Uh, we are working with NHS boards to support international recruitment to try and overcome the barriers that Brexit has put in our way. Uh, we are also investing £11 million in international recruitment over the course of this Parliament. Uh, indeed, that has already delivered 191 internationally recruited nurses in the past year, uh, with a pipeline of many more due to join. Tess White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The average number of available staffed hospital beds in NHS Scotland is at its lowest level in a decade, decreasing by 10%. In NHS Grampian, the number of available staff beds has fallen by nearly 30%. That's a shocking figure. First Minister, what urgent steps will this government take to restore beds in our NHS and boost capacity for pa patients in the North East? First Minister. Well, of course, as the Royal College of Emergency Medicine uh, said, uh, the uh, reducing bed numbers is largely because of shortened hospital stay. Uh, you know, if you look at the average length of stay for hip replacements, that's fallen from just under 14 days uh, to six and a half days. The average length of stay for knee replacements has fallen from 12.2 days to 5.7 days. And of course, for cataracts, which used to involve a, a hospital stay, these are now done on a, a day case basis. So it's important that we ensure there is an appropriate uh, number of beds in our NHS, and uh, we will continue to do that. But of course, uh, as I've already said, uh, the Royal College also pointed out that the Sc Scotland has a higher number of beds per head of population uh, than in Wales uh, or in England, where the Members' Party, of course, is in government. So there are big challenges in Scotland, uh, but I think that uh, suggests that this government is getting to grips with those challenges better than we may see elsewhere. Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister already knows, delayed discharge rates are soaring, with an increase of 8% in March of this year. That's one in 10 beds occupied by people ready to be discharged. This is a result of continued failure by this government to properly fund social care in Scotland and support the workforce. Does the First Minister accept that if her government was serious about freeing up bed capacity in an NHS, they would properly fund social care and show that they value social care workers and unpaid carers by committing to a proper workforce plan, decent terms and conditions and a wage of at least £15 an hour? First Minister. Um, I agree, actually, with uh, much of the sentiment behind that question. It is vital uh, that we have a, a good quality system of social care, because uh, not only is that right for its own sake, that helps to reduce pressure on our National Health Service, uh, and that is crucial in terms of getting delayed discharges down. And Of course, we are investing significantly in trying to reduce delayed uh, discharges. We are also investing in hospital at home, for example. In terms of the social care workforce, uh, to whom we owe an enormous debt of gratitude, there have been two pay increases uh, for the social care workforce uh, over uh, the past year, and of course, all of us want uh, to see that go further uh, still. Uh, but as I uh, have just said in response to Gillian Mackay, uh, this is also uh, about underlying staff shortages uh, that have been deeply exacerbated yeah. by Brexit. So we need to focus on how we overcome that, as well as the other challenges uh, that we continue to focus on. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is okay, a debate so that was First on Minister's question today, and as we can see, the First the Minister herself the was actually able to turn that back to Parliament today. She had to be deputised by John Swinney last week, as Nicola Sturgeon had COVID. She appears to have made a full recovery. And after the questions from backbenchers, then, you might have seen that Douglas Ross, uh, of course, began by uh, wishing the Scottish football team the best of luck. They will be kicking off uh, this evening, just a few miles down the road from here against Ukraine, of course, but potentially two matches away from the World Cup finals. So everyone uh, offered the best wishes to the manager and the players tonight. So on to the serious questions, Douglas Ross for the Conservatives decided to lead on the question of £20 million earmarked for the Scottish independence referendum. Why, he said, um, in the difficult budget situation that we faced, why is the what he called a massive sum of 20 million being set aside. Now, in reply, the First Minister said she was delighted to receive that question from Douglas Ross. She outlined the problems that were caused to Scotland by the restrictions in the budget, 
that came up later in another question. She's saying that the Scottish budget is being squeezed by decisions made elsewhere. And she said in that context, with these financial difficulties, she is in fact delighted to be able to offer the Scot Scottish people an alternative. So she thanked Douglas Ross for saying that, well, well, we don't have to accept that. We could in fact move to a referendum and that would put the Scottish, Scottish uh, people in a completely different place. Uh, so that was maybe not the... the uh, maybe Douglas Ross didn't have the open goal he thought he had when he put that question. Uh, so the First Minister again in her reply said that Scot Scotland has been held back by Westminster and the financial statement by Kate Forbes delivered yesterday shows how much it is uh, held back. Uh, now she also said that when you look at the overall budget package, overall funding package over the next five years, which was outlined yesterday in Parliament, the 20 million on independence referendum is 0.05%, half of 1% of the Scottish budget. And she said, considering the amount of uh, financial autonomy that Scotland would then have, she considered that oh, half of a percent uh, an extremely good investment. Um, next, Douglas Ross came on to say that the cost of living crisis was not mentioned in her answer. And that, that I think, took this... the. Took the first minister by surprise because I, I, thought, I thought that's really what she was talking about mainly. Uh, she said that the amount that's been spent by Westminster in mitigation of the um, increased rises is, uh, is very small in relation to... Um, and by the way, she also said that the various cuts which have been delivered to Scotland uh, by the Westminster government... Um, it's costing Scotland 700 million to mitigate those cuts. So compared to that, 700 million, uh, 20 million on uh, an independence referendum is not only good value, but also a very small amount of money. That was the First Minister's answer. Um, uh, next, he said that uh, Douglas Ross said that Rishi Sunak had offered Scotland huge sums of money, and that money has been squandered by the Scottish government. Now, this came up later on in other questions. Um, so... Again, the First Minister said that what has been given by Rishi Sunak is really very small compared to the £1,000 per household in universal credit cuts. Um, so, um, again, Douglas Ross is saying, Rishi Sunak has given you all that money, what are you doing with it? And uh, again, uh, Nicholas Sturgeon is saying what they're giving is not as much as what they're taking away. Um, she also, uh, Nicholas Sturgeon also criticised Douglas Ross for saying that some of the money he says is squandered was, for example, money to keep Presswick Airport going, she says. Is that a waste of money, keeping that airport going? Uh, does that show how important Douglas Ross thinks are the jobs which have been protected at, uh, at Presswick? Now, finally, in his last question, Douglas Ross said that it's time for the First Minister st to stop blaming what he called the Westminster bogeyman. Uh, but again, the First Minister replied, our budget is dependent on decisions that are made elsewhere. Uh, but she repeated uh, on um, something that was read out yesterday. She said that the Scottish government has been able to send more children to university from poor backgrounds. So the Scottish government, she says, is delivering. Now, she was referring to a report by the Scottish the Commissioner for Fair Access to Higher Education, who reported yesterday that the Scottish government's attempt to level up to get more people from poor backgrounds into university has, I quote, been an unambiguous success. Um, and again, the First Minister quoted these figures. We've heard just yesterday that a record 16.7% of, of students from Scotland's poorest 20% uh, communities are now on first-time uh, university degree courses. And this is an increase, and it's also better than anything that's happening in the other parts of the UK. Uh, so again, Douglas Ross is saying, what are you doing with the money? You're squandering it. And uh, Nicholas Sturgeon is saying, no, we're not. We're making extremely good use of it and we're delivering value for money. Next came Anna Sarver for the Labour Party, asked about waiting times uh, in the NHS. And um, other questions came up on that later on. So the First Minister's response is to say that obviously there's an increase in waiting times because we've just had two years of the pandemic. Lots of events which would have happened had to be cancelled and that was a necessity. She also reminds members that that's of course happening not only here but just about every other country as well. In fact, she finally said, is Anna Sarwar the only person on the planet who fails to understand the impact of a global pandemic? Now, the question of hospital beds came up again in subsequent questions. And again, 
The figures here are that there are fewer hospital beds than there were a few years ago, but to these, to Anna Sarwa and to other members' questions, the First Minister made two points. First of all, some operations don't require a long stay any longer. So the way hospital beds are added up, it's the number of people times the number of days they stay in them. So therefore, if you don't need to have people in those hospital beds for as many days, that shows a statistical decrease in the bed usage. But that's, um, that's actually good uh, because it means that, for example, the First Minister said that um, the number of days you have to spend in hospital following a hip operation has gone down to something like half. Uh, I forget the exact figures, but um, if you can get people out of hospital beds and home quicker, the statistics appear to fall. But that's actually not a bad thing. That's actually desirable. And it's a reflection of better ways uh, of treating people. Um, another question was raised uh, by, the, by Labour members about Erasmus. The Erasmus is a student exchange scheme, which, of course, we are no longer ac access, uh, able to access because of Brexit, which Scotland, again, did not vote for. Um, Labour members raised the fact that the Welsh Government has accelerated its replacement for, ex for the Erasmus, Erasmus, and it turns out that the Scottish scheme won't be ready for several years. In response to that, the First Minister said, rather than coming up with a second best replacement, it would, be, it would be better if Scotland could actually rejoin the EU as an independent member, and then it wouldn't be necessary to come up with another another scheme. Uh, so those were the main points, as uh, if you have time to watch, there are other points raised. Let me just look at one more issue, which um, was raised by Murdo Fraser. He was referring, referring again to the financial budget, to the high-level budget estimates, which were read out to the Parliament by Kate Forbes yesterday. He said, what's the government doing about the 3.5 million gap? I mentioned this earlier on. Um, this is the notional gap, which some people think was happening, uh, think is going to happen. Now, the... Um, it's not a real th figure, it's a possibility. The First Minister replied that the, um, the Scottish Government has to balance. That's actually a legal responsibility. So she says there wouldn't be a gap. Every year the Scottish Government balances because under the Scotland Act it's required to do that. There will, however, as Kate Forbes pointed out yesterday, have to be some parts of the budget which are prioritised. Therefore, other parts will be, be squeezed. And again, members raised, uh, raised questions on that. OK, so that, that's it from um, us for our coverage of, uh, oh, let's just have a look. Yeah, OK, let's have a look at Loch Lomond again. There was finally a question raised about uh, by Ross Greer of the Scottish Green Party about a potential theme park at Loch Lomond. We've just got to, time to go for that again. Now, if you haven't heard about that before, uh, a, a company from Yorkshire who run a, a theme park business called Flamingo World put in a proposal a couple of years ago to uh, move flamingos into Loch Lomond. I don't think that's part of the natural biodiversity of the Trostax region. Now, as Ross Gear pointed out, the original proposal by Flamingo, Man, what, Fl Flamingo Land was thrown out uh, during a, um, a very well-supported uh, public campaign. I think he said something like 60,000 complaints were given to the... Um, to the planners. And so Ross Greer asked again that now that Flamingo Land have redrafted their proposals and they're coming up with another scheme, another theme park holiday scheme, uh, Ross Greer asked again that the Scottish Government throw that one out as well. Now, in reply, the First Minister pointed out that it's not actually a Scottish Government decision. Planning decisions within the Loch Lomond and Trostax National Park depend on the National Park Authority. However, she did say that any planning decision would have to be based on the overall principles and the overall objectives um, of the planning authority. So anything that doesn't fit in with the, the, those, um, those ambitions uh, should be thrown out, but that will be by the National Park Authority. Okay, so if you live in that area or if you're a, a fan of Loch Lomond and the Sax, you could pay attention to the, the planning application by Flamingo Land, uh, which was just published recently. So clearly the Scottish Greens are uh, very worried about that kind of development, that kind of commercial development. Um, and I know I don't think flamingos are a natural feature of life in Loch Lomond. Ducks, maybe. Um, well, is that about it for today? I think that's what we'll do for this afternoon. We'll, we'll tie it up now. So thanks for watching Broadcasting Scotland's coverage of First Minister's Question Time. We hope to be able to do that more often. And um, the more money we get in, the more programmes we put out. It's as simple as that. Now, if you'd like to contribute to um, helping us not only pay our bills here and keep going, which isn't easy, but hopefully even to expand 
the range of programmes. And please look at our website, broadcastingscotland.scot. And if you click on the donate button, it really would be good if you could start a wee standing order and keep us going here. OK, so that's it for this afternoon's coverage of First Minister's Question Time, live from Holyrood. And the, we'll be back tonight with the news. So our nightly news, Scotland at 7, uh, later on with myself. And um, so I hope you can tune in and join us then. And uh, so thanks for watching this afternoon. So from Hugh Stewart in the Glasgow studio, bye for now, and I'll see you later.